Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. My name is Tony Kelly Foster. I'm the President and CEO of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. We're an institution dedicated to global education, international affairs, and global communications. It's our honor tonight to host the last public appearance of the ambassador from Iraq. And I'm delighted to see, Ambassador, that in your honor, along with uh, the members of our board who are here, J Congressman Jim Moran, if you'll stand, please, and be recognized. <laughs> Congressman Moran is the vice chairman of our board of directors, and we're very fortunate to have his commitment to our success and to have him here with us tonight. Bill Courtney, please, our chairman of our International Affairs Committee. Any other board members? I'm sorry, my list stopped at two. <laughs> Tonight's an important night because, first of all, I want to talk with you a little bit about how Iraq became Iraq. May 16th was marked the 100th anniversary of the Sykes-Picot Treaty, a secret agreement between Britain and France to carve up the domains of the Ottoman Empire upon its defeat after World War I. Over the years, much blame has been heaped upon the architects of the treaty. British diplomat Mark Sykes and French diplomat Francois Georges Picot for drawing up the artificial borders of the Middle East, particularly Iraq's. Iraq is a close ally of the United States. So far, 242,000 troops and civilians have given their lives over the conflict in Iraq. And almost 25 years after the United States initially became involved in the region, a military presence of 3,500 Americans remains alongside a Gulf state coalition force of 90,000. Some US senators have called for the number to be tripled signaling further foreign military involvement that may disrupt the development of Iraq's infrastructure and economy. However, on the floor of the U.S. Senate 2007, it was proposed that Iraq should be divided into three regions, Iraq, Kurdistan, and Shiistan. Each region determined by the three major religions and ethnic groups in the region. Shia Muslims, Sunni Muslims, and the Kurdish people. Many have been quoted saying that peace amidst these divisions is impossible, that stability was previously held together only by the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein, who was deposed by the United States-led international coalition in 2003. As the birthplace of civilization, Iraq has a rich cultural history and diverse demography. Out of a population of 37 million, the majority of the population of Iraq is Arab, with another 15 to 20 percent Kurdish. Five percent of the population is Turkmen, Assyrian, or other. Iraq is a land-linked nation and borders other notable members of the region. Iran, Turkey, Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. In 2013, Ambassador Lukman al Feli arrived in Washington, D.C. to assume his position of Ambassador of Iraq to the United States. He possesses a rich history of experience in consulting, technology, and very importantly, as a representative and advocate for Iraq and Iraq's people. Ambassador Al-Fali 
actively opposed Saddam Hussein's dictatorship and advocated for democracy in Iraq. He was an active leader in the Iraqi exile di diaspora, serving as a trustee for non-governmental Iraqi organization, supporting Iraqis who had fled their homes from persecution. He continues to be a vocal and articulate advocate about his vision for Iraq's future. He promotes the need for a multifaceted approach to development that not only focuses on physical infrastructure or an oil-based economy, but focuses on the balance of cultural and 21st century needs. As a young country with 65% of its population under the age of 35, Ambassador El Fali vocalizes the need for jobs and an, and an economic environment that will allow for expanded trade and opportunity, particularly for young entrepreneurs. He also advocates for greater public engagement and communication by people, not just politicians or diplomats, across cultural and political borders. He's active on Twitter, which he uses to directly engage with followers and expand the global conversation beyond what is conveyed through mass media. A champion not only for his people, but for education, cross-cultural awareness, communication. We're very pleased to have him at our independent, neutral, and nonpartisan World Affairs Council Forum tonight. During his tenure in Washington, Ambassador Al Fali and his government have worked closely with the United States. Iraq has successfully held democratic elections with millions of their countrymen and women going to the polls to elect their representatives in parliament in the face of threats and violence perpetuated by terrorists and extremists. There was a new unity government formed by Prime Minister Hadir al-Abadi. In addition, the ambassador led the charge with the US government to combat Daesh, as well as the formation of the US-led coalition to fight Daesh. Also during his tenure, the US Congress announced through the final National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal 2016 that it would continue to support Iraq. Separately, the embassy oversaw the repatriation of more than 60 Iraqi cultural treasures that were looted from Iraq and brought to the United States. On the personal front, the ambassador is the proud father of four boys. He has run several marathons, including the Boston Marathon in 2013, in solidarity against acts of terror. Moderating today's discussion is Dr. Jessica Ashu, Deputy Director of the Middle East Strategy Task Force at the Atlantic Council, Rafiq Harari Center for the Middle East. Dr. Ashu focuses on multilateral approaches to the growing challenges of state building and extremism through the, throughout the Middle East. Please join me in a very warm, loud, and lengthy welcome for Ambassador Lukman Al Fali to World Affairs Council's DC Ambassador Series Program, being broadcast live from the Horizon Ballroom of the Ronald Reagan Building International Trade Center. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I'm first of all honored to be at the World Affairs Councils here in Washington. Uh, Congressman Tony, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm not just honored, but have the privilege of being here for the first time. However, uh, I have also had the privilege of being across most of the quite significant amount of that uh, World Affairs Councils in other states. It's one of the key events I always, when I go to an outside Washington, try to interact with via the World Affairs Councils, because I know that the diversity and the richness of this audience, the sincerity of their questions, and their ability to look at it from a pure, uh, I would say US and Iraqi perspective. So they don't come in with a baggage of, of the history, but try to understand and find the truth. So to that effect, thank you for, for sharing your time with me today. Um, my talk will briefly be talking about the 
global challenge. Where does Iraq and Middle East fit in from that perspective? And then focus on the bilateral relationship. When I was asked whether I want to do it on the record or off the record, I'm always anxious about such a question, to understand the audience, to see how open can I be. On the other hand, this is my last event. So um, I'm somewhat have the confidence that people will not, cannot run up behind me and, and, and sort of challenge what I have said. But as a point I took on upon myself on the first day I arrived here in the US, and that is to be truthful, open, and look at our uh, US stakeholders as partners and look at them where the win-win situation is what we can achieve. Unfortunately, uh, from 2003 until I came to, to Washington, it was clear for me that the dialogue was not deep enough. The truth of what's taking place, uh, the Iraqi project was not projected in the right manner, and certainly people were not aware what were the drivers whether in Iraq or here in Washington for me to explain to my people back home. So the truth, uh, sincerity, looking at it from a win-win perspective was one of the key drivers. And today, uh, tonight, I hope to stick to that formula. It proves to me that the Americans do seek truth, that they are sincere in supporting Iraq. But at the same time, uh, if people are not do not have the understanding of what, what are the reasons behind what takes place back home, then unfortunately this misinformation or lack of information means that their decisions will not be rich enough. So for me, that's an obligation I will hope to stick to. Once you look at the global challenge, one uh, are always amazed by the complexity of them, also amazed by the interdependency of that. Managing complexity to me is one of the key challenges any world leader faces today. Even any congressman or senators or others, to understand the depth, the width, the ability of United States to influence politics across the, 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 the shores and in, in, in wherever the US influence can be projected. Managing that complexity is an issue. Let me give you some of the element of that. When you look at the global uh, challenges, you can find cyber, uh, refugees, human rights abuses, nuclear issues, uh, terrorism, and so on. When you look at the Middle East as a region, you can find that majority of global challenges do fit the Middle East phenomena. Nuclear, we have an issue in the region. Water shortage, we have an issue. Uh, external or internal displaced people, we have an issue with that. Terrorism, has been an issue. Cyber, less. But on the other hand, we as a region have had a, an issue, internal issues, which had had ramification across the globe. So unless the region is fixed, unfortunately, global challenges will always be there. The geography, the history, the richness of that region, the demography of that region will always be a point. Managing complexity does mean that you need to manage that aspect of it and should not be thinking about containment or any other uh, strategies or inaction as a strategy, for example. When you look at the Middle East itself, you have additional challenges to the global challenge. And that is, for example, threat across states, integrity of states, governance, demographic issues, inability of state to control the social contract between citizens and the region and their leaders has certainly been fractured. The Arab Spring can clearly manifest that. So in, the, in that context, you have terrorism as one of the core manifestation which touches based on all of what I've talked about. Terrorism is not a unique phenomenon. It is not a self-contained phenomenon. It's a phenomenon which goes across communities, challenges the identity, links, the history of that region with the position they are seeking. Fundamentally addresses that there is a lack of governance, ability to comprehend ma and manage complexity in the Arab region and in the MENA region and as a whole. Here, the US positions is crucial. So when I look at that perspective, I ask the question, where do we fit in Iraq? 
in that relationship. It's primarily to look at the relationship, I mean, Tony talked about 25 years of US engagement with Iraq. But let me look at the last 12, 13 years, primarily since 2003. You go, we, go, we went through three phases. 2003 to 2011, primarily a military uh, relationship based on US major, majority military engagement uh, and post the liberation occupation of Iraq thereafter. 2011 to 2014, prior to the invasion of Daesh or uh, occupation of Daesh to Mosul and part of my country, the relationship went uh, through a lull and went through uh, what you might call uh, a, a quiet relationship, where it wasn't clear what is the what is what are the drivers for that relationship. US were not heavily engaged. Iraqis were not heavily requiring U.S. engagement. However, since 2014, mid summer of 2014 up to now, there is a significant U.S. re-engagement, significant uh, political engagement to complement the security engagement. Why? Because the challenge of ISIS is not domestic to Iraq. It's a regional challenge. It is a manifestation of what we have uh, what we have in Iraq and in the region. The illnesses as much as the challenges I talked about before. The global threat, ISIS or Daesh or any of the offspring of Al-Qaeda possess is still there. Clear, present danger. The challenges to addressing it is still questionable. In a sense of, is the US and other countries willing to invest in identifying the root causes of this or will containment be their approach for it? It's not my problem, or it's somebody else's problem, or not on my sh sort of on watch. These are the key challenges we in Iraq are asking and others are asking. The US position itself as to what it wants, if it wants to be a global power, is in question here. Does it want to have that role with the cost and benefit associated with it, or does it think that it can contain the problem to a certain extent? I can assure you with my humble experience, it cannot be contained. Why? Because they are deep. They have been there. It's not an issue of a phenomenon which can be addressed easily. It addresses the root identity of the region in which nation state as a concept isn't challenged. I might even say that over 20th century, it's clear that that region has not been able to feel in harmony with itself in relation to the post-World War I uh, formula and second, certainly post-World War II. That challenges in a region which is significant, uh, what you might call a, an epic center in relation to energy, in relation to ideologies, religion, and so on, means geography, means that it needs to have an attention much more than it has been given so far. If you are, so what that tells me is where we are now in relation to US, I would say it's at a crossroad. Does it want to invest or does it not? Well, if it doesn't invest, what are the ramifications for it? If it does want to invest, what does it take to do that? Here, I think it's an important question. We in the region are asking, specifically when we see the elections and we see the, the discourses being talked about in relation to our region. We are worried. Because this indecision in itself has its own ramification because of the size of the U.S., because of the history of the United States in our region. On the other hand, the challenges we all face, whether it's a state, ability of the state to, or the country to talk to each other, does mean that we need an interlocutor. The zero-sum formula which is being practiced day in, day out, between states in the region means that you need a big brother or you need an interlocutor to bring some senses, define some roadmaps, and create a platform for dialogue. Dialogue is significantly missing in our region. Players still expect the other to give up. Players have certain expectations, certain nostalgia, and are seeking it. That vacuum, which is as a result of what we talked about over the last 12 years, has meant that uh, instability is the formula coming forward unless we control it and unless we talk with each other significantly. ISIS, let me repeat it, is a manifestation which needs to be addressed to provide the region with a breathing space for its politics to work out. 
Without it, I can assure you, the region and hence Europe and hence the globe will have significant issues to worry about, not just terrorism. When you look at the perceptions of US in the region, there are questions to be raised. Does it want to, to engage or does it not? Uh, is the dialogue taking place with the people of the region or only with the rulers and of the region? Is US have clarity of what it seeks those relationships to be? As an ambassador who's been here for three years, I can say with, with confidence, I cannot say that I have clarity what will take place after the next election here in the US. I know that ISIS as a, as a threat is, will be there. And that in itself will create enough for us to talk about and discuss. But what is the vision for us for this relationship moving forward? It's a key question. We in Iraq have to do a lot of soul searching and what do we require from the US and what do we require from our neighbors? What are we willing to give up for the sake of what we gain? On the same side, here in US, it's an issue for us. Where do we want that relationship to be? What are the platforms? What are the agreements? What are the pacts we have to engage with each other to have a stable, predictable relationship moving forward? That conditionality requires some soul searching, requires us to look into some of the root causes, not all, be positive, look forward to it, and try to contain the damage ISIS has caused. Some of those damages are irreversible. The damage to communities, whether they are Azidis, whether they are Christians, whether they are Turkmen, Shia, and, and so on, have somewhat been uh, tremendous. Those IDPs, for example, in Iraq and in, in where you see the ramification of Syria and others, does mean that significant engagement need to take place to move forward to provide some kind of a roadmap for relations between US and the region. A lot of countries have different questions, and I'm afraid up to now, most of them have not been answered. We hope that the next election here in the United States can provide some uh, light at the end of the tunnel. However, in my humble experience, I'm trying to still looking for that light and where the sources are. So let me try to finish by highlighting a few questions because I think the Q&A would be more beneficial than me talking about it. I think we need to focus on the, the, the short-term issues we need to work with. We need to align our priorities. We need to align our interests. We certainly have too many commonalities for us to, to be um, less focused on it. Those commonalities relate not just to security, relate to prosperity and development. The, let me give you an example. The fight we are doing day in, day out against terrorism in Iraq, that fight has meant that all communities in the liberation of Fallujah, which we're talking about now, all communities have now know that they need to work with each other. They all know that they all need to share the blood and the sweat and the resources so that they can develop their country. But at the same time, they do need significant help in technology and abilities and others. ISIS is conducting a, a new type of warfare. It's so vicious, we need to think beyond the, the normal convention, think outside the box for it. So to that effect, I think it's important that stability of Iraq is seeked here in the United States. A, because of the richness of resources, which means uh, unstable Iraq will significantly have an issue of all, all productions in the world. So that's one aspect. B, that the center, the epic center of the region has been Iraq. This is not coincidental. There are a lot of reasons behind it. So to that effect, I think we need to think about new agreements, whether the current strategic framework agreement is sufficient enough or not. I think it needs to be revised. And I do think we need to think beyond the current challenges as to how do we see this relationship three to five years, uh, in which we as, a, with we as countries think that we have common projects and common purpose. I will finish here and, and let's rest for Q&A. Thank you again.
Thank you, Ambassador, for being here. It's such an honor to be able to host you for your last public appearance as Ambassador to the United States. Um, I'd like to start with the question that is on everyone's minds. You mentioned uh, the liberation of Fallujah, the battle that's currently underway right now. Um, this is an operation that has a lot of emotional resonance for Americans because of the high number of Americans who were killed um, in the Battle of Fallujah, the two battles of Fallujah in 2004. Um, there are American advisors currently um, advising the operation that's underway right now. I want to ask, um, what is the role of non-Iraqi forces in this battle? It's been very controversial. It's been well publicized in the press that there is the participation of Shia militias in these operations. And so I'd like to ask, what is their role, and where does the chain of command lie? The chain of command, uh, thank you for your question, Jessica. The chain of command does lie with the prime minister's commander in chief. All those who hold arms, whether they are military, uniform, non uniform, semi uniform, uh, have a due report to him. And to that extent, uh, we are yet to find one example across the last two and a half years or two years fighting we have had with, against ISIS where those people have not adhered to the commander in chief. So to that effect, I think the, the formula is clear. However, we also have what we might call complexity of so many stakeholders. So in, in Ramadi, it was easier than Fallujah in the sense that in Ramadi, you wanted the tribes. It was more localities. You wanted some uh, coalition forces, air support. You wanted the Iraqi forces with uh, uh, what you might call them the uh, uh, the one trying to find the out of English words for it. The popular mobilization forces who are tribal. In the PMUs and here in the media, sometimes they call them the militia. You have Christians, you have Azidis, you have the whole collection of Iraqis who are part of that. You also have some part of them who have ideologically allegiance to Iran. And nobody's doubting that, and nobody's questioning that. And I don't think that's an issue here. Why? Because the liberation is in Iraq, by Iraqis. Their blood is being spilled. Their sweats, their sons is being killed. You, you don't have to always question the, mo the ideological motive for the fighter if he's fighting for the liberation of his country. You, in the United States, had to cooperate with Soviet Union and had to cooperate with others during World War II because of the strategic interest and the threat, the scale of the threat with Nazism. Here we have a much vicious enemy who does not even exist, believe in the existence of your physical existence, let alone your allegiance. So to that effect, I think the complexity of Fallujah is, uh, can be seen because of the close proximity to, the, to, uh, to Iraq, to, to Baghdad, close proximity to Najaf and Karbala, and its uh, legacy. But let's, let's also remind the, the audience that Fallujah was taken by ISIS prior to the summer of 2014. It was in December 2013, which meant that that area had, uh, let's call it, more hardened locals. And this has been one of the reasons behind the anxiety of the coalition before when we talked about Fallujah. Now, you mentioned in your remarks uh, the importance of addressing the root causes of the issues in Iraq and the rest of the Middle East. And when we talk about Fallujah, uh, it seems that the battle and the liberation is actually only step one, and that there's going to have to be a very, uh, very intensive process of reconciliation in order to bring neighbors back together and to uh, restore some uh, element of coexistence and, and make it a functional city again. Can you comment on plans for such reconciliation? We have had uh, some examples, some call them case studies to follow. We have had it before in Tikrit, in Ramadi, uh, in part of Diyala, uh, and, and so on. So to that effect, uh, we have a model where we're trying to improve it moving forward and hopefully for Mosul, inshallah, as well. That model means you need collaboration of the tribes. You certainly don't need the army to keep control of those lands, and you need to have enough numbers of local police, local tribal men, to hold and control their land thereafter. You certainly need 
some funds from the central government in their construction of our core infrastructure. And for post-liberation stabilization, we need significant contribution from local government and from others. That's where we have been lacking support internationally. It's in the post-liberation areas, whether it was Tikrit and others. The other model is to accelerate return of IDPs, internal displacements, to their homes. However, one of the challenges we faced before when we talked about Tikrit, which is, a, a, which is an only Sunni city, Sunni Arabs, to might add, that was, for example, an intertribal issue. And that's one of the other complexities, where issues of revenge is, is one of the cultural attributes. Here, it's important for us to make sure that any liberation take place that intertribal challenges or issues does not exploit. On the other hand, ISIS, as an ideology, as a practice, do depend on dividing and on using sectarianism as a method of control and uh, projecting fear. That has been one of another challenge for us. So it's in a way, it's not a natural trench war where you liberate and, and you move on. It's areas where you already have population. Therefore, these are Iraqi citizens. Whether they are Sunnis or Shias is irrelevant here. They are Iraqi citizens. We, as a state, have a responsibility for them. So liberation is very important. Making sure that the day after politics is crucial. The prime minister has tried to decentralize, delegate. But I can assure you, what we're doing in Iraq is a new form of managing wars, which hasn't taken place before. Because ISIS's method of warfare is new. Now, one last question before we move it to audience questions. Our host mentioned that this year is the 100th anniversary of the Sykes-Picot Agreement. And when many people look at Iraq, they point to Sykes-Picot and Iraq's borders as being part of the current day problems. And they point to partition along sectarian lines as being a possible solution. I'd like to know your opinion of the feasibility of that as a solution. Well, state as an entity is an organic entity. So, and that's, no single state can say, I'm there for eternity. So that's, that's sort of the normal where you start from. That's OK. On the other hand, you do have an issue where if the new borders are based on ethno-sectarian lines, then why should it be confined to the current borders of Iraq? If you say that the new Iraq is Sunni, Shi'i, Sunni Arab, Shi'i Arab, and Kurd Sunnis, which is primarily Sunnis. I'm a Kurd and a Shia, so I'm lost in this, uh, <laughs> the, in this tripod perspective. But let's say, for argument's sake, you can clean cut, you bring a good surgeon, and he can cleanly cut the country. Where do, what are the current borders where you can say it's fair enough? OK, you don't have a historical narrative to base it on. You also have an issue of a new narrative being promoted, which is called sectarianism, or ethnics, or other aspect of it. So why would it co be confined to the current Iraqi borders? Why? There is no reason behind it. And in fact, you're destabilizing the region as well, as well as making sure that Iraq cannot uh, function together. The other aspect of it is, let's say we have issues of governance in the south, in Basra and southern countries. Or we have issues now on governance in KRG, for argument's sake. That's nothing to do with sectarianism. That's to do with good governance. We need substantial amount of good governance to be able to understand what democracy is about, decentralization, and the whole objectives and vision of, of the post-2003. These are nothing to do with sectarianism. You may want to seek a simple solution, but in, in effect, the, the ripple effect of that simple solution will be too hard. The societies are not ready for any type of division. That certainly their history is not associated with it. I'm not saying that decentralization should not be the theme or federalism should not be the theme moving forward. In fact, we do. And in fact, dictatorship of Saddam Hussein has taught us that we'd never want a, a, a central strong Baghdad. That's no longer the vision. And nobody is asking for it. You want a functioning enough a center to be able to provide a more win-win situation. That's the working progress project which we're working on. It's not easy. We're not in a harmonious region. We're certainly not in a democratic region. And to that effect, Iraqis 
do feel frustrated that they haven't received the support from their Arab neighbors whom they were seeking before. Thank you. Um, we'll move to audience questions now. We have a microphone set up here on this side of the auditorium. Um, you can queue up behind the microphone and ask your question. Uh, a couple ground rules. Please keep your question short, two sentences, and please ensure that the second sentence ends in a question mark. Uh, you suggested, Ambassador, that, that if you were to divide up the country, uh, why stop at the existing borders uh, of Iraq. Uh, but you've got some issues, I would think, with uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Iran, if you were to take that position. Now that uh, you are free to speak your mind, would you mind addressing uh, the respective roles, uh, whether they be constructive or destructive, that those three uh, large nations have played with regard to Iraq's region? The, the the situation we have is the legacy prior to 2003 was of Saddam occupying and causing frictions, if not havoc, to his neighbors, whether it was Iran or Kuwait or Syria or destabilizing the situation, even with Jordan, who was, Allah, was supposed to be ally to him. So let's not forget the Kuwait invasion. So to that effect, I think that the countries in the region were not comfortable with the new Iraq without understanding what it takes. They also understood that the region is not democratic, which means that uh, self-governing is not a, a natural characteristic of the society. And with the US engagement, which didn't get the buy-in of the regional players as well. That's another aspect of it. In, in an ironic way, Iran was the first country to recognize Iraq post-2003. Although the relationship with US and Iraq and Iran where more or less, uh, I can't say that they're, they're supportive in any way, shape, or form. So to that effect, it tells you that the complexity and the drivers for, the state, for these regional players ha are, are different. The other issue is since 2003, US has uh, significantly reduced its uh, footprint in the region, politically, militarily, and so on, which meant that uh, the regional players, Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and others, do seek to have to fill the vacuum. And that's another challenge we have had. So to that aspect of it, regional players, some recognize, like Iran recognized right away, Saudi Arabia only a few months ago their ambassadors were present in Iraq. On the other hand, we do need support from the neighbors. We certainly need recognition that they cannot go back to the post uh, pre-Saddam or post uh, uh, pre-2003 situation. If some Arab countries are nostalgic about Saddam Hussein in a sense of dominance and strong man power, that's no longer the formula in Iraq. People do seek democracy at a very high cost, by the way. And I do say that openly. The Americans didn't teach us what democracy is about significantly. We had to learn the harsh way. And unfortunately, a lot of homework was not done, which meant that we had to pay the penalty for that. So to that effect, regional players should play a role they have an opportunities. Iraqis are, in one way, forgiving. They certainly, Iraqi, need the neighbors, which means that there is an opportunity for, for defining our common interest. But at the same time, Iraqis are stubborn people, as you in the United States have found that. We are not easy to deal with if we don't trust our, our neighbors. So some elements of trust are crucial for us to work with. Is it possible for... Um the government, the Erdogan government, to be a constructive partner in the campaign, the eventual campaign to retake uh, Mosul and make it a part of uh, the country that's attached to the government in Baghdad. Is that possible? And could you just opine on that, give us some wisdom on it? I'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I don't know whether it's wisdom or not, but let me say that Turkey and other regional players is where we had had issues in relation to the fight against ISIS. We certainly were expecting much more from Turkey to provide us in the common threat we all face. ISIS is not an, a pure Iraqi domestic problem. It's a transnational entity which has had effect elsewhere. Its natural uh, occupation, its natural presence are in Sunni countries. It's not in, in Shia, in that aspect of it, which means that immunization from Sunni communities need to increase to be able to fight this 
virus, vicious virus of ISIS. So to that effect, Iraqis have paid high price. We do have high expectations of Turkey to stand up to that challenge of being a constructive player, looking at the bigger picture, and not viewing the prism of PKK or any other dimension. It is certainly a national threat to them. We understand that. We're not saying that these are not uh, domestic issues which you should not focus on, on the country. We in Iraq have tried to be a stable player. Our Kurdish gover KRG government have always tried to be a stable player in relation to Turkey, as historically as well. So to that effect, we will be more than happy to work with Turkey. But ISIS is the number one threat to the region. It's an immediate and clear danger to the region. Turkey needs to stand up to that challenge. If they view that this is somewhat uh, a transactional versus a strategic view, then unfortunately we will all lose out. That's what takes place in Syria and others is a result of regional players, global players, international players not allowing their interests, and certainly somewhat being uh, acceptable for refugees and so on. For us, that's a, a natural disaster which will have projected, which will project itself into Europe and elsewhere. Such what's taking place in Syria should not be acceptable to any stakeholder, let alone to Turkey and others. I'd like to take the big picture, the historical picture. Um, and do you think, two questions. First, would the people of Iraq have been better off if we never went in there in 2003? <coughs> Second question, would the people of Iraq have been better off if the Obama administration had followed through to be more helpful to Iraq? In, in relation to first question, Iraqis now have the will uh, to think, and to a certain extent, the will to act. Prior to 2003, we didn't have neither of them. So we couldn't think. We were not allowed to think. We were not allowed to act. How long will it take for the country to, to stabilize and to prosper? That's in our hand, to a certain extent. There is international dimension. There are regional, global, as I talked about before. But it's in our hand how much we want to promote social harmony or how much we want to play zero sum. I think now Iraqis realize that whatever support we received from the US before, uh, let's call it an unconditional support, now it's conditioned. So we have learned the harsh way that we need to be better judge of characters in one way, understand what it takes to stabilize, which is in our hand. But at the same time, the burden and the legacy of Saddam Hussein should never be underestimated. Please don't forget that from 75, 1975 onward, uh, Saddam took us through wars, whether it's against the Kurds, Iran, Turkey, sanctions, and everything else, which meant that we have a, a whole generation where they're only brought up in a culture of violence. So these are the legacies we have to do with. We now have a, an opportunity. We never had it before 2003. That we have an opportunity. We do certainly question the US homework, let's put it this way, in 2003. They significantly, I don't think anybody can say confidently here in the US, let alone in Iraq, that they did their all they can and they did their homework accordingly. I think that, but that's an issue for us to work with each other. That's an opportunity for us to, uh, to utilize whatever investment we've done together in the blood, the sweat, the resources, the legacy, and so on. I don't think it's beneficial for the US to, to, to say, well, we should never be engaged in any other country. I don't think that's feasible. I don't think that's beneficial. On the other hand, it's also useful to, to be able to have a full understanding of what it takes to engage with other countries, let alone a complicated country such as Iraq. Here, whether in relation to 2008 onward, I think there was an understanding, I think it's wrong, that the region should manage itself that Iraq is a burden or a fatigue? Yes, but on the other hand, I've been here three years, I've talked to a lot of people in military and in non-uniform NGOs. None of those who worked in Iraq are fatigued. 
Maybe the public, maybe the media promoted it, but those who worked with Iraqis and were in Iraq were then military, and they have been around. They were not fatigued. They understand the victimization of our society. We now need to have the courage to get out of this victimization mindset, and that requires a lot of courage. And we're discovering it, which we're finding now in the fight against ISIS. Uh, a lot of the political debate that's taken place in this country over the past 15 years has basically said the U U.S., he, last gentleman put it and said, was it a mistake? More specifically, it's been stated in, in a political debate, is the U.S. made a mistake in going in there and therefore that we caused or, or what our actions did led to the quagmire in Iraq, to the military involvement and in, in, uh, the rise of, of ISIS, et cetera. Um, I recognize I'm not trying to put you too much on the spot here, no, but no, it's, it's uh, uh, what, what would have happened? I, I don't want to um, revisit the whole debate, but you know, can you address your thoughts about that, but also pointed toward what type of military involvement might the U.S. need to take in the future? We certainly need to look at our military agreements and our military pact between the two countries and in the region as well. We need to define one which is sustainable. And when I talked about as to what's the situation next year, I really don't know. I really don't know how much a new president here in the in, in US, he or she, can, can, can view this. And how do they see the, the legacy aspect of it and the cost benefit realization for it. However, I know that the threat we face prior to 2003 in the globe and regionally and with Al-Qaeda has nothing to do with the Iraqi invasion or liberation. 9-11 took place well before then. What took place in Afghanistan was well before then. So I think it's an oversimplification. As I said before, managing complexity is one of the key challenges we all face, if we, which means that there is no single driver for it. There is no single solution for it. We in Iraq now, even if we resolve, let me give you an example. Even if we resolve all the problems we have, Without addressing significantly the demographic increase, our economy cannot be sustained to the level we want. That factor alone. But that factor does mean we need to be better uh, socially, planning, family planning, and all other non-political elements has to be managed as well. So if you're looking at the situation and saying 2003, was it a mistake or not, that's not for me. So it's for you to, to judge and for historian to judge. However, what I know is that illness, the tumors in that region need to be cleansed, need to be addressed, and they are much more than the 2003 phenomenon or ramification for it. And certainly there is always consequence and uh, sort of uh, inaddressed consequence or ill-addressed consequence or, uh, with, to, to the actions, and I, I know that much. That's my point about the homework not to be done. And I, I know that much. We could have been much more effective, much more focused, in addressing the, the, the situation in Iraq, where there would have been less casualties across all. It's not beneficial for us in Iraq and in the region that the US feels that uh, its investment did not have any reward. That's not beneficial for, for us in the globe with the current situation. US has significant power, whether it wants, it's like it or not, it has significant economical, political, cultural power, which can help human development across not the Ebola or the other things, but much more significant issues, whether it's environment and so on. So to that effect, we do need a, US, a healthy US outlook into the world. What we see here, what I see here in the election debate and everything else, it tells me it's a country in transition without clarity of how long that transition will take and the ramification of the, those in decisioning and moving forward. To that effect, we do need a focused US for our sake, let alone for your sake. Ambassador, there has been a talk of a safe haven being placed in Iraq for uh, Muslims, Christians, other groups displaced by ISIS um, using Kurdistan as a model. Do you support this idea? I have had discussions with some NGOs who talked to me about it and my, my input has been, we need to look at the big picture. Some irreversible damage has taken place. People need to recognize that whether it's to do with heritage sites, whether it's to do with some people who left Iraq already, 
And I do go to the communities across, whether it's Michigan, elsewhere, and see the Iraq communities, whether the Mendean Christians, uh, Turkmen, and so on. So to that effect, unfortunately, that's uh, an identity issue we need to reconcile and we need to focus on ourselves, for our own identity, for our own self. The last thing we want for Iraq to be is Shia pure, 100%, or Sunni pure, or Turk, or Kurd only pure. The other aspect of it is not feasible because none of the provinces of Iraq can be as pure 100% one ethnicity. None. In most southern part of Iraq is villages where there are Christians. Most southern part in Basra. So it tells you that it's, there's no need for us to re-engineer the society demographically. We certainly have lived with each other, coexisted with each other way before dictatorship, way before Saddam Hussein, way before sort of a lot of other nations were even existed, which means that we can do this again. However, we have uh, had a major reflection which we missed, major opportunities which we didn't grasp. So to that effect, including 2003, for us, I think it's a major loss for Iraq is not to grasp the support we had from US. But at the same time, partnership takes two to tango. You can't do it alone. We need all parties to help us in that aspect of it. So the community solution is one solution which people are trying to experiment with. However, I could see it only as an experiment. I don't think it will be the, a good, uh, what you might call a lasting solution, because the reasons for the divisions I talked about before, the reasons for issues with governance, whether it's in Basra or others, still apply elsewhere. You could see when you look at the Kurdish problems now that they need to get their politics better. That's, these are all Kurdish entities, by the way. This has nothing to do with Turkmen or Azidis or whatever. It's pure Kurdish to Kurdish parties and they need to get their act together for the sake of the stability of Iraq, for the sake of the, the focus we need to do in the liberation of Mosul. So it tells me that we face, a, not a mirror, but numbers of issues we need to address. And to that effect, we require a substantial amount of focus for a generation or two to come, where selflessness is the key characteristic. We cannot build this country, Iraq, without people thinking about their children and their grandchildren. If they think about themselves, then unfortunately, the problem will prolong. And that's one of the key challenges we as the Iraqis need to address. I'd be curious of the ambassador's views on the idea of, as a way to build national cohesion, and the idea of an oil dividend, whereby a portion of the export revenues of Iraq <clears throat> are given directly to the Iraqi people and bypass the state bureaucracy uh, this would be along the lines of a, an Alaskan model or in Norway. Uh, this will be my pure Lukman Faley's opinion. This is nothing new to the government. I personally think that those who talk about that do not fully appreciate the complexity and the governance required to build the country. Let me give you an example. We faced majorly the need for infrastructure, large infrastructure projects energy, roads, issues which go beyond a province. That's how, so how do you manage that? We certainly need major development in the education and healthcare. These are all issues which require substantial amount of revenues. We certainly need major ability to understand what it takes to be the issues of entrepreneurship, small to medium-sized enterprises, and so on. All, all industry produces 95% with less than 1% of our workforce, which means that we have an opportunity for us to go and train a substantial amount of our youth into the development of the country. That cannot take place by the by passing all the, 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 the cash we can afford. We have been doing it, by the way. Whomever promotes that, I will challenge them and say, we've been paying salaries with only a cycle of money going once. Salaries, products purchased from outside. Salaries, cars being purchased, and so on. So people traveling, and so on. So to that effect, if the infrastructure is not there, banking, insurance, and whatever else you need to, for, so that people put their money aside and, and recycle the, 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 the fund and the, the resources you need, then how are you going to do that? 
People still don't know empowerment to the extent we, want, we hope them to be. Medium to small size enterprises is not there for us to, so that people have a small amount of funds and raising it. So to that effect, I think it's a nice, novel idea. But I think it's, a, its timing is substantially wrong. And I will challenge anybody with such an idea to tell me how does he want to build the country based on such a model? How does he want to build large infrastructure project? Unless he goes into privatization, total privatization of the country, and then even for that you need major infrastructure, legislative, culturally, and, and so on to provide that. I just wanted to ask, based on your experiences here and your time in the US, and based on current events that are happening you know, in the US, in Iraq and also elsewhere around the world, what would be your recommendations to the next ambassador? Obviously, uh, one of the nice surprises I had when I came here, by the way, when I came to the US, I've never been to the US. It was my first trip as an ambassador, day one. I've never even been as a, as a private citizen, let alone as an official of the government. I was amazed by the generosity of the people, their ability to support you. But to do that, you need to have high integrity. You need to be open, frank, consistent, understand what it takes, and also look at the situation from a number of issues. Don't just look at it as, as some of my colleagues have tried to do. And when I go back home, they say, focus on victimization of the society. That's not good enough. People have interest in, in your country, whether it's strategic, financial, others, cultural, whatever. You need to look at that as well. So you need to do your homework substantially. It's a very large country, which means you have to travel a lot just to get a glimpse of what this uh, continent is all about. And to do that, my wife, uh, you, need to, 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 you need to have a, a, a high caliber, as I have had, who is who's willing and uh, can accommodate uh, such a lifestyle uh, in which you have to travel all the time, and, and so on. So to that effect, I think it's not an easy, and I can assure you, no US ambassador would want to be the US ambassador in Washington. Because <laughs> what it takes, seriously, what it takes is not a, you need to have a lot of energy, drive, focus, and so on, to be successful. To be successful, and uh, for one final point, which I think is useful, uh, whomever comes over here, he needs to have uh, specific objectives, can't be broad so many issues, not nice to have, not a checklist, very few specific issues. Like for me, the key specific issue is for the relationship to become predictable, where we know where we stand, what are the issues, and we can address it. It doesn't have to be full allied, because that's a much bigger issue, the task than an ambassador. That doesn't have to be that uh, people don't know where you're standing. I think it's important they know where you and your country stand in issues. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.